Why don't I, uh, there is a quote from the beginning of Judge Van Dyke's concurring opinion that I thought I'd read for our listeners so they can kind of gauge the tone uh, that he's taking. And uh, so so here's Judge Van Dyke uh, from his concurring opinion. Quote, since our court's Second Amendment intermediate scrutiny standard can reach any result one desires, I figure there's no reason why I shouldn't write an alternative draft opinion that will apply our test in a way more to the liking of the majority of our court. That way I can demonstrate just how easy it is to reach any desired conclusion under our current framework, and the majority of our court can get a jump start on calling this case en banc. Um, and then he goes on, performs the, the two-step analysis, uh, Sean, that you just uh, alluded to. And then at the end, Judge Van Dyke says, for these reasons, we affirm the district court's dismissal of plaintiff's complaint for failure to state a claim. You're welcome. Basically saying uh, to the rest of the court, you're welcome for doing uh, your work for you. Uh, so that drew a little bit of, uh, of criticism from, uh, from legal commentators that this was, uh, this was uh, maybe, a, maybe a little bit disrespectful. Um, or undipl an undiplomatic way of doing it. Uh, I do. I, I did hear a report that at least one of Judge Van Dyke's colleagues was none too pleased at this. Um, but uh, but, but I, how else? How else is a judge uh, supposed to voice concern about the direction the court is going, regardless of where you are on guns? How else? I think this is a great way for a uh, judge to voice concerns about trends, bigger picture issues that go beyond one case. That's just me. I've never seen a judge write his own concurring opinion before in a case in which he authors majority. But I, you know, I, for one, if I got a vote, I would say uh, it's a perfect way to let off some steam and, and educate his fellow uh, uh, justices and judges about what's happening on the bench. I, I, I agree with you, Jeff, in that, you know, uh, it is unorthodox and, you know, it uses a, a semi, you know, uh, derisive tone that, 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 you know, decorum is a little, a little lacking, but, um, you know, uh, parody and mockery can be powerful tools of persuasion. And like you said, call attention to an issue that, that others might be. And I, I genuinely do believe that these judges who are signing on to, uh, the, these opinions that Judge Van Dyke shows walks you through how they are lacking in 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 logic, frankly, and uh, and, and support. And I, I think some of them are are so tied up in the emotion of the gun issue that they they do fail to see that he's making legitimate points, um, and and that the, the logic just doesn't flow. I mean, if it, he demonstrates, it's actually quite masterful. Uh, uh, parody and, and writing. And uh, for those of us who have been doing this for years, this is the stuff we say behind the scenes, uh, frankly, like, I mean, you're going to say it's a, a right. That, that's like, for example, the carry issue, right? The, the, the court's going to say, we're going to assume that the second amendment protects the right to carry, but then we're going to say intermediate scrutiny applies because it's not a ban on guns in the home. And that uh, just because uh, guns are dangerous, we can just sort of justify that right away. Like, I'm sorry, that's simply not the way constitutional rights work. You've now converted a right into a privilege. Either you have a right to do something and the government has to meet a high burden to take it away from you, or you don't have a right, in which case, you know, it, it's a privilege. And so it, it's really that kind of just under the surface, this, a, a lot of these uh, unfavorable Second Amendment opinions can be dispensed with. Um, but as as uh, Judge Van Dyke, you know, uh, demonstrates uh, in, in a in a in a way that I frankly enjoy, <laughs> uh, but but it's not my style. You know, I, I obviously wrote an amicus brief that I told you all about, or that Tim you mentioned uh, in SCOTUS, or I co-author, I should say, with my my colleagues. Yeah, um, yeah, well, and I wanted to get that in in, uh, in just a minute. Sure. Um, I did think uh, just I, I wanted to offer my two cents on this point about. Um, about Judge Van Dyke's tack here, and uh, I, I do agree with um, with both of you on that. Um, that, or or at least, you know, maybe maybe the volume could have been taken down a little bit. But uh, I can I can empathize with uh, with this frustration. All of us as practitioners have had that moment where uh, you're reading the opinion against you, and you're you're thinking, okay, okay, but where was my where is the court's response to my key argument, my my lead argument? Where is it? And it's not there. 
And sometimes you get the feeling that uh, that members of our profession, including judges, can just kind of sweep things under the rug, give you a lot of uh, word count on other issues that you didn't really care as much about, uh, but not uh, not on on the issue. But when I read that uh, that part of Judge Van Dyke's concurrence, where he says, "This way, I can demonstrate." just how easy it is to reach any desired conclusion under our current framework. I thought of this. I just read uh, uh, Louis Manon's uh, uh, book uh, on, uh, on uh, various American figures, including just, uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he pointed out that uh, Judge, Justice Holmes used to like to talk uh, to his colleagues on the Supreme Court when they were conferring about a case that he would admit any legal principle of law that they proposed. And then he would use that to decide the case under discussion in either, in, in either, either direction, uh, because Holmes was a famous or an infamous exploiter of the malleability of words. Uh, and that inc incidentally is why he is both a monster of civil liberties and a hero of civil liberties and a, a monster of free speech and a hero of free speech, uh, because he could read the words uh, or uh, read uh, into the words any meaning that he uh, thought was appropriate for the outcome of that case. And um, you know, that betokens to me a problem with, the, with, with an interpretation when it can lead to any outcome you like. Yeah, it, indeed. I, I think while you might have objections with uh, Judge Van Dyke's tone, I, I think that if you read his concurrence alongside the Ninth Circuit opinions that he is referring to and, and taking to task, I think he's vindicated uh, in, in his approach and, and his criticism. And I think that this will probably end up being his legacy. Uh, and, and that will mean that 50% of people will love him in the future and, you know, reading back about him and 50% will view him less favorably. But I also think that, uh, that what he's pointing to here is going to be Chief Judge Thomas's legacy, which is the unfair, and I think it's objectively unfair treatment of a, a fundamental right. And I think any fair minded person will see it as that if they if they look at the details and realize that it was unjustifiable what what how uh, Chief, the, the Ninth Circuit has treated the Second Amendment under Chief Judge Thomas. And that's going to be his legacy. And I think there will be more than 50 percent who will view that legacy as unfavorable. So Judge Van Dyke will, uh, I think, outdo Chief Judge Thomas in, in the history books on that score.